you remember that is uh, I completed the part one of Sons and Lovers. Okay. Uh, I just started the part two of the text, but obviously I could not uh, afford to complete due to the coronavirus epidemic. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. What, I, what I plan is that is, plan is, that is I would like to would discuss like to certain very vital issues. Tell you which you find which you may find in mind for your exam okay so that is first of all is uh, you remember that is i i gave you uh, a synopsis of the novel that is you see it is the synopsis given by lawrence himself given by lawrence himself and that synopsis is available in one of the letters in one of the by d h lawrence and that synopsis, and that Holy synopsis, God. though it was written in connection with the connection with uh, the first draft of Lawrence's Fancy Love, so which was called Paul Morrill, which was called Paul Morrill. But this also has an important bearing, has an important bearing on the final uh, version of the novel, which we read, and which he calls Sons and Lovers. The first thing is that is you see. Uh, See, uh, there are three issues which I plan to discuss in today's class. Number one is number one whether you can consider Sansa Lovers as an autobiographical novel. Okay. So this is quite important for us because you see that uh, if you if you read any standard biography of D. H. Lawrence, you will find some of the important details which run parallel. With the details which you find in the fictional version, that is, which you find in the body of the narrative, which we call sons and lovers. I would certainly talk about those things. Uh, you see, uh, the first thing is, you remember that is I gave you a poem, a short poem. The name of the poem is Mr. Herring. Uh, that poem is quite important because it throws a critical light upon the very social background. Okay, the family background because you see the father and the mother they come from different socio-economic backgrounds. So my father was a working man and earlier was he at six in the morning, they turned him down and they turned him off for tea. So emphatically Lawrence uses the expression, my father was a collier. And what about the mother? My mother was a superior soul, a superior soul was she cut out to play a superior role in the goddamn bourgeoisie. So it is important, the very loaded expression, goddamn bourgeoisie. Okay. And my father is a collier. So you see, if you read the first two, three chapters of the novel, you will find how important is this very text, Red Herring, for the understanding of the very tension which often prevails in the domestic ambience. So almost, almost every weekend, I mean, when Mr. Morrill comes back home, he appears in the role of a drunken bully. And there is a fight between the father and the mother, and the children are stricken with fear and anxiety and horror. And in most cases, we find that is the ash tree that remains, of course, outside, but it bears witness to the very domestic tension between the parents. So this is obviously one very important point and as I gave you that material in which you will find this important point that the novel is largely based on the author's life and experiences. Particularly you see not only his childhood but his adolescence and his attachment to Jesse Chambers. Uh, though there might be some other women apart from Jesse Chambers who provided the model for Miriam Levers in the novel. 
but certainly the most important woman uh, whenever we speak about the portrayal of the character of Miriam Levis, we time and again remember Jesse Chambers, who was his fiancé, and even the family details, they're also important for us, uh, because time and again we find that Paul visits the family of uh, Miriam Levis, uh, but Critics like Kit Sager are of the opinion that not only uh, Jesse Chambers, another important woman is there, whose name is Flossie Cullen. So some of the details uh, perhaps are based on Lawrence's visiting the family of Flossie Cullen. Okay, but again, I mean, I repeat that uh, Jesse Chambers is playing a very crucial role in the adolescent life of the author. And you see, uh, even when I read with you uh, that section of Sansa Lovers, where you find that there is a kind of, you know, that title of the chapter is Defeat of Miriam. Defeat of Miriam. And where we read that, you see, uh, uh, yeah, this is, when I look at you, what I see is not the kissable, embraceable part of you. What I see is a deep spirit within that I love and can go on loving all my life. Look, you are a nun. I give you what I would give a holy nun. Uh, you see, that is when we read the letter, you see, I can give you a spirit of spirit love. See, you are a nun. I've given you what I, I should give a holy nun as a mystic monk to a mystic nun. Uh, you see, that is. These two quotes, uh, you please check your study materials, uh, where I've quoted both from the novel and from the letter written by Lawrence. And I would ask you to, uh, when you, you know, set these two quotes side by side, obviously you would understand that how the life runs parallel with the fiction. The letter written by Lawrence to uh, Jesse Chambers and the letter written by Paul to Miriam Levers, how they run parallel with each other. That is the point. So when you talk about the autobiographical elements, obviously it's a very vital point. Please take note of it. Another important thing is, that is, when we talk about this very girl and uh, lad love story, uh, about, uh, about that treatment about the representation of this very love story. Obviously, it is Graham Half who speaks, okay, eloquently. Okay, if you read uh, The Dark Sun, okay, a study of Lawrence's works by Graham Half, you will find that Graham Half, you know, speaks eloquently of this very treatment of the adolescent love story. But what is important here is, that is, you perhaps remember that I, during the class, also referred to an important work. Uh, the work is written by Jesse Chambers, the title of which is uh, A Personal Record, A Personal Record. So if you, if you read A Personal Record by Jesse Chambers, and if you read Sansa Lavas, and if you, you know, set these two versions uh, side by side, again you will realize that is there are some gaps. And Jesse Chambers tells us that, you see, Lawrence did not, I mean, portray their love relation in genuine uh, color. And you see, as she comments, the reality was so much more poignant and interesting than a semi-fictitious account. So he calls Sansa Lovers a semi-fictitious account, quote-unquote. And he, she also opines, I mean Jesse, that Paul Morrill, the early version of Sansa Lovers, you know, was basically Lawrence's mother's story. And she was convinced that if he could work out artistically and within himself all the issue of his mother's life, and the implications, not only would he write a magnificent novel, but he would read himself of his obsession with regard to his mother, 
and we are free and a whole man. So according to Jesse, I mean, the laurels of victory were handed over to mother at the expense of herself. So the author gave the laurel to the mother and obviously the author did not take much care of the fiancé. So this tension is quite significant uh, and uh, this is a very vital point for us to take note of the, because we have to remember that is uh, Lawrence after all is writing a novel. He is not reproducing reality that way. He is writing a novel. He is writing a fiction. So there might be some elements of reality uh, obviously in the novel. But that does not mean that everything that the no, I mean, novelist narrates in Sons of Lovers is true to the reality that we have to remember. And another vital point to which Professor Keith Sager draws attention is that is actually he quotes a sentence, a statement from Lawrence that is one shades one sicknesses in books. Okay. And the full quote is this, one shades, one sicknesses in books, repeats and presents them again, one's emotions to be master of them. So this last phrase, to be master of them is important for us. Why? Because you see, that is, Lawrence, let's imagine, was trying to, you know, master all the emotions which made him uh, his, his life a hell, uh, if you allow me to use the word hell, is the kind of tension he used to suffer from by writing this kind of novel. He wanted to engage in a kind of autotherapy. So that sort of thing. So when you were writing this uh, essay uh, on, the, on the autobiographical elements in Sunset Lovers, you should also take note of uh, if you read the introduction by Professor Keith Sager, there might be some other elements, but basically these are the things that you should take note of. Now, the next issue, I believe that you are hearing me. Can you hear me all? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. You. So the next issue that I also plan to discuss is, that is, as you know, the Oedipal theme. Because if you read again Graham Half, you will find that uh, where Professor Half states that the whole situation presents the Oedipus improglio in almost uh, classic completeness. The whole situation, I repeat, presents the Oedipus improglio in almost classic completeness. And in my material, study material, I have given you two quotes. Uh, number, you see, uh, first of all, one quote from, uh, I mean, which is there in Graham Hobbes' book, and another quote, of course, uh, from the text. I would be giving you two other quotes. I would be reading them out for you. So the first thing is that is uh, particularly, again, autobiographical situation. Okay. How when you discuss the uh, theme of Oedipus complex in Sons and Lovers, I believe this quote again would be important for you. The day before his mother's funeral, we went a walk together. At the end of the same walk, as we stood within a stone's throw of the house where his mother lay dead, he said to me, you know, Jesse, I've always loved mother. I know you have, I replied. I don't mean that, he answered. I've loved her like a lover. That's why I could never love you. So this quote, quotation is very much significant for us. Very much significant for us. And you see, I have been quoted a section. Uh, I mean, a section where Paul is talking to his mother. Okay. When Paul is telling his mother, I feel sometimes as if I wrong my women mother. How wrong them, my son? I don't know. He went on painting rather despairingly. He had touched the quick of the trouble. 
So when we read the novel, I believe that we should not miss this loaded phrase, the quick of the trouble. The quick of the trouble is, of course, at the heart of this discourse, <clears throat> the Oedipus uh, complex. And as for wanting to marry, he said his mother, there's plenty of time yet. But no, I even loved Clara, and I did Miriam. But, I, but to give myself to them in marriage, I couldn't. I couldn't belong to them. They seem to want me, and I can't ever give it to them. Give it them. You haven't met the right woman. And the last sentence is very important for us. And I shall never meet the right woman while you live. So please, I mean, if you could mark this, that I shall never meet the right woman while you live, this statement made by Paul Morrell is of great significance for us when we are discussing the theme of Oedipus complex. You see, that is uh, Paul Timon again tries to accuse uh, his, his beloved, the Toki, you are, you are uh, so spiritual and I'm so damn spiritual with you all. But it's not the whole story. I mean, we cannot cite only this thing uh, as a factor that was responsible for the failure of the relationship between Paul and Miriam. Because you see, Miriam certainly was positive and uh, Yes, Mrs. Morrell was very nervous, angstridden, because she could sense that this girl is going to absorb her son completely and she would leave no share for her. So this is important. And obviously that is why Paul felt very dreary and hopeless between two women, one the mother and the beloved. So you see, uh, uh, this very theme of Oedipus complex is so significant. I can, uh, of course, uh, uh, give you some other quotes. Uh, this is my Penguin edition of Sons and Lovers. And this is page number 266. Chapter, chapter title is Strife in Love. Strife in Love. So I just read a section from this in order to help you understand uh, how strong the tension was. You see, uh, Mrs. Morrell almost gave an injunction, if you allow me to use the word injunction, that is, Paul should not go to meet Miriam. But yes, though Paul tried to check himself, but again, that kind of compulsion was there. So again, he started going. Okay. And there is a kind of dialogue, uh, a conversation between the mother and the child that be important for us while we are discussing this theme of Oedipus complex. What is it? That is, what nonsense, mother, you know I don't love her. I, I tell you that I don't love her. She doesn't even walk with my arm because I don't want her to. So this is Paul's statement. And the mother says, then why do you fly to her so often? I don't like to talk to her. I never said I didn't, but I don't love her. Is there nobody else to talk to? Not about the things we talk of. There's lots of things that you are not interested in that. What things? Mrs. Morrell was so intense that Paul began to pant. Why painting and books? You don't care about Herbert Spencer? No, and you own at my age. Well, but I don't know and Miriam does. And how do you know that I shouldn't do ever try me? So Mrs. Morrell says that, have you ever tried me? How could you know that I don't understand your poetry, your philosophy, that only Miriam understands? So this very conversation is again very, very significant. Okay, because Mrs. Morrell feels that her son is being drawn by this young girl whose name is Miriam Levers. And there is another section, uh, which is, I mean, the chapter title is The Defeat of Miriam. This is page 303 in my Penguin edition, where Paul is telling his mother again an important conversation between Mrs. Morrell and Paul Morrell. Uh, you think I ought to marry? Then the mother says, sooner or later every man ought. But you'd rather it, it were later. It would be hard and very hard. It's as they say. And then the mother says, a son's my son till it, till it takes him a wife. But my daughter's my daughter the whole of her life. I repeat, a son's my son. A, a son is my son till he takes him a wife. 
but my daughters, my daughter, the whole of her life. So this is a very significant statement. Okay, this is a kind of age-old proverb that Mrs. Morrill echoes. And then obviously Paul says, you think I would let a wife take me from you? Well, you won't ask her to marry your mother as well as you. She could do what she liked. She won't have to interfere. She won't till she would guard you. And then you'd see. I'll never see. I will never marry while I've got you. I won't. But I shouldn't like to leave you with nobody, my boy. My boy. She cried. So this sort of conversation again is very important for us. Where Paul Timon again tells his mother, I, I, I'm not going to marry. So you see, uh, while we are discussing this theme of Oedipus complex, that yes, uh, if Paul is damn spiritual with Miriam Levers, if that is one uh, point of the story, then certainly it is Clara Dois who gave Paul a sort of baptism of fire in passion. But then again, we find that Clara went back to her husband, Baxter Dois. And when the mother dies, there is no one around him. That is why towards the end, he whimpered, mother, mother, because the mother is the only person that supported him. So you see, um, the point is that is, uh, when we talk about Freud and psychoanalysis, when we echo these terms like, like, like Oedipus complex or Electra complex, you know, that is this kind of, Oedipus complex is what? It is kind of mother fixation. Okay. And I can give you one important uh, statement which I find in the introduction given by Itzega, where, uh, I mean, uh, this is a quote, quotation from Lawrence's uh, book on psychoanalysis, where he writes that is, uh, the old son lover was Oedipus. The name of the new one is Legion. And if a son lover take a wife, she is only his bed. And his life will be torn in twain. And his wife in her despair shall hope for sons that she may have her lover in her hour. So this is significant. I can give you the, uh, the reference. Uh, the reference is this. That this is from Lawrence's Fantasia of the Unconscious. So you see that is the old son lover was Oedipus and the name of the new one is Legion. Legion, you see, because he speaks in terms of plural, because there are so many people who are victims of this mother fixation. But what is interesting is this, that is, there is a kind of debate among critics and scholars regarding the point whether Lawrence was aware of the psychoanalytic theories uh, which are available in Freud's books. And even he writes that I was not aware of the Freudian theories while I was writing my novel. So to what extent this may be true or not, I don't know. This point can always be debated over and contested. And this is one important point to note that his wife was a German. Frida Weekly was a German and Frida did know some of the latest theories of Sigmund Freud. So it is possible that Lawrence came to know of the Freudian theories from his German wife. But Lawrence was not at all happy with this kind of appendage, with this kind of description that uh, it is a it is an Oedipal novel, uh, etc. etc. So uh, this is important to note that is uh, in a letter written in 1914, he made his position clear that I'm not Freudian and never was. Freudianism is only a branch of medical science. Interesting. The very word interesting is yes, very interesting for us because. This reveals that Lawrence tried desperately to distance himself from all this kind of appendage. Okay, 
from all this kind of uh, you know uh, description and you see uh, there is a letter uh, where uh, he was protesting against the psychoanalytic sort of review of his novel sons and lovers it is also available in your study material please check it i hated the psychoanalysis review of sons and lovers why he hated it because you see the martyr complex it's bogus okay because you see he says that they have tried to pigeon hole my book these critics they try to you know uh, they try to uh, carve a half lie out of my book but my book is a fairly complete truth it is important my fiction sons and lovers is a fairly complete truth but is a pity of it this critics and scholars they try to carve a half lie out of it so this critics and scholars have not been able to do justice to my fiction and it's a bogus business because half lie is dangerous okay so while you discuss this issue of you know edipus complex please note all these points and i don't know whether you remember i you know read in some detail some of the important sections of the narrative uh, uh why why we find that this is a tremendous kind of connection between the mother and the son and sometimes very highly symbolic i'm going to discuss the uh, issue of symbolism soon but before i pass on to that discussion let me tell you that is you remember that in the early portion of the novel while paul was simply a baby and one day what happened that is the baby was in the mother of the lab and mr morel came back as a drunken bully as usual and there was a tension of the quarrel cropped up between the parents and you see mrs morel of course gave her cut answers and mr morel yes out of drunken frenzy he threw the through the drawer and the edge of the drawer cut the brows okay the eyebrows uh, i mean i mean the yeah the temple of mrs morel and she was bleeding and one or two drops of blood got soaked in the white towel in which the baby was wrapped this is highly symbolic because time and again lawrence uses uh, this kind of statement that blood is very important so that very uh, drop of blood which got soaked in the towel in which the baby was wrapped it is highly symbolic as you can see so there are obviously uh, i mean touches scattered throughout the narrative if you read the novel closely you will find for yourself i have only just you know you know quoted some passages etc from the book but of course you can cite any other passage relevant for the purpose of the discussion of this theme of oedipus complex so have you got it yes sir ha ah. uh, okay yes sir okay okay now yes sir ah, yes sir ah, thank you uh, uh, of course i can give you 5 uh, 4 minutes okay 4 minutes uh, for the discussion on the discussion uh, i mean some questions of course you can raise questions of fine right? no the last issue that i plan to discuss is that is the use of symbol okay you see uh, i while i worked on lorenz's letters I, i found a very important statement in the in one of the letters of lorenz that is uh, you know when uh, as a student of literature when you try to uh, understand okay what is a symbol symbol is a word that you cannot simply i mean categorically define you can try to describe symbol but it's not very easy to define a symbol symbol is a sign is a mark whatever for example a lion is a symbol of courage a red rose is a symbol of love okay 
and white the color is a symbol of purity the idea is you see while you discuss the use of symbols in sansa lovers we have to know at the very beginning what is lorenz's idea of symbol and that is why i i i refer to the letter well lorenz writes that symbol is uh, and of course before that all art is all art is of form symbol conscious or unconscious of form is a french expression the meaning of which in english is basically so all art is basically symbolic whether it's a part it's a conscious design of the author or not all art is symbolic and in that very letter lorenz also observed that for example if you refer to lorenz's last novel lady chatterley's lover you will find that even as he says the wood is symbolic the mines are symbolic and also the paralysis of i mean clifford chatterley okay it is again symbolic so you see uh for example the paralysis of clifford chatterley is symbolic of the post war trauma yes but when we talk about uh the use of symbols in our present concern sansa lovers one thing uh, i would like to share with you before i proceed further the first point is that is uh sansa lovers can very well be described as a lyric in prose as a lyric in prose this is important and let me tell you at the outset that is while i read that novel uh, i mean uh, golding's lord of the flies at the ug level as an honor student my first response was that is lord of the flies is a lyric in prose and there was an essay in our honor course also charles lamb's the praise of chimney sweepers again we can very well describe as a lyric in prose my point is sansa lovers is also a lyric in prose okay lorenz was also a poet and uh, i would give you some quotes obviously some uh, from lorenz's own words uh the the first thing is that is uh in the novel as you know uh particularly in the first part and also in the second part we find that flowers have a very important role to play flowers and the first point is that is you see uh i can read from a section uh, this is page number 59 60 this is uh, towards the close of chapter 1 and you you remember that is uh, the story that mr morel has driven his wife out of the house okay and at the point of time she was pregnant and the moon was high up in the sky and the lily flowers are all around the ambience was thick with the you know sweet smell of the fragrance of the flowers so i read a section she became aware of something about her with an effort she roused herself to see what it was that penetrated her consciousness the tall white lilies were reeling in the moonlight and the air was charged with their perfume as with a presence mrs morel gasped slightly in fear she touched the big pallid flowers on their petals then shivered she seemed to be stretching in the moonlight she put her hand into one white bin the gold scarcely showed on her fingers by moonlight she bent down to look at the bin full of yellow pollen but it only appeared dusky then she drank a deep draught of the of the scent it almost made her dizzy this is important this elaborate passage is important for us in order to understand the use of the symbol the symbol of the lily flower in this context you might have noticed the sentence 
how powerful the sentence is that is the air was charged with with the perfume as with a presence so the lily flowers as if they represent a speaking presence and the color is also important the color is you see dusky and again golden etc etc so when i mean uh, later on mrs moral is described we find that is mr moral is described with this colors you know dusky golden so you see the lily flower and the complexion of mr moral symbolically they are the same and you see regarding the the presentation of the character of mr moral okay you know that the image of a candle is offered the image of a candle candle can give you light candle can give you warmth this is significant for us and later on you see uh, uh obviously i have quoted a passage i mean a critical passage from alistair niven alistair niven is a, a big critic of d h lawrence and you see alistair niven observes the formalism of the scene as mrs morel bends down to the cup of the lily particularly recalls the annunciation to the virgin mary as it appears in a number of renaissance paintings in which gabriel carries the lily as he brings the news to mary of the child within her lawrence uses the iconography of botticelli or raphael to bestow mrs morel a madonna like grace so it is important how alistair niven you know if you read the passage you will find that even when you think of mrs morel as if you think of madonna this is important uh i i started my discussion on the use of i mean symbol in sansa lovers with the statement that flowers indeed play a very important role in the novel and particularly in the lad and girl love chapter we find abundant use of the symbol of flowers this this is symbol of wild rose bush okay uh miriam wanted to show this wild rose bush to her lover uh this is important miriam wanted to show why as you know that miriam is a very shy sensitive girl okay very introvert but she by you know by this rose bush by showing this rose bush to her lover she wanted to have a spiritual communion with paul morel so this is important that is miriam could not unfold her soul she could not speak out that she was in love with paul so this wild rose bush is a kind of symbol of the kind of secret soul of miriam lavers so this is one important thing if you talk about other flowers uh sometimes the language is very symbolic i remember one passage in sansa lovers where you know paul is telling miriam that uh, your flowers are cold miriam says cold this is important the use of the word cold is very significant so does it symbolically signify the sexual frigidity of his fiance we don't know but as a close reader of the text is it possible for us to remain indifferent to the very nuanced language which lawrence uses in this connection uh you see uh there is a there is a criticism uh there is a kind of critical statement on the part of dorothy van gain where uh again dorothy van gain is a very great critic so where you see dorothy van gain opines the relationship of the girl to the flowers is that of a blasphemous possessorship it denies the separateness of living entities the craving to break down boundaries between thing and thing that is seen also in miriam's relationship with paul whom she cannot love without trying to absorb him so you see whenever a miriam you know uh you know when whenever she she 
sips the flower you know she offers her fervid kisses this use of the word fervid is important for us this might signify that yes miriam is a very possessive girl so you see flower is very important and later on in the relation between clara doyce and paul morel again flower plays a very significant role uh, there is one important section in the narrative where you find that paul and clara make love in open space of the earth and you see when clara rose we find we find that is uh, the carnation petals okay uh, with which they almost they look like splash drops of blood so the whole ground is as if uh, filled with the splash drops of blood so this carnation petals resemble the drops of blood and blood as already i have indicated is playing a very important role in the context of lawrence's novels not only in sansal lovers in any other major novel of d h lawrence uh in the novel the stars the moon the birds all of them have their own significant role to play uh i don't know whether you remember i talked about the the sing- symbolic uh significance of the big orange moon uh this is again a uh, a thing which you can locate in the part 1 of the novel uh miriam actually has joined paul's family and they have gone to a trip and at the point of time there was no one around them and miriam is drawing the attention of a lover to the big orange moon in the sky and if you could locate the passage you find that is uh what is it i i can read the section from the novel what is it murmured miriam waiting for him what is it she murmured again it's a moon he answered frowning yes isn't it wonderful the crisis was passed so the idea is that is miriam is a full grown girl so obviously she she knows what is it it's a moon but she wants desperately to draw the attention of a lover to the big orange moon so this big orange moon perhaps symbolically signifies the immensity of passion but we read the statement the crisis is past so this moon is symbolizing the immensity of the passionate craving uh that miriam has or even paul also has to a certain extent uh and i have also commented if you check this story material you will see that i have also commented that here paul can be compared to a certain extent with uh prufrock eliot's prufrock because prufrock didn't have the strength to force the moment to its crisis it's also true in the in the case of paul model so he didn't he lacked the strength to force the moment to its crisis that's why the crisis passed so this is important again and uh you see uh Dorothy Van Gaen also talks about a symbol of minds. Okay, the image associated with model is that of the coal pits, where he descends daily, and from which he ascends at night, black and tired. The symbol of rhythmic descent and ascent. This, this is the comment of uh, Dorothy Van Gaen. And I also uh, talked about the symbol of ash tree. Uh, yes. uh particularly remember at the section that is towards the end of part 1 of sons of lovers you will find that the ash tree produced a kind of sound uh as if and later on we find that towards the end of the novel part 1 of the novel uh, the eldest child of the family that is you remember william dies so as if the sound of the ash tree uh 
uh, yes, as it blows, okay, in the wind, in the rough wind, as if it, it prefigures a kind of tragedy in the family history. Okay, since the lovers has been called uh, a great tragedy by D. H. Lawrence. Yes, it's, it's indeed a great domestic tragedy. So as if the ash tree uh, is prefiguring by its moaning, uh, by its mournful sound, as if it is prefiguring that something sad, tragic is going to take place in the family. So this is uh, where I have quoted, uh, yes, uh, but it is important to note that Mr. Morrill, of course, liked the noise caused by the tree. It was music to him. But the other children, they hated it. And to Paul, our protagonist, it was a kind of demoniacal noise. And I have quoted from the poem Discord in Childhood. This is important because uh, this, this, this poem will help you understand the symbolic significance of the ash tree. Outside the house, an ash tree hung its terrible whips. And at night, when the wind arose, the lash of the tree shrieked and slashed the wind. And the ship's weird rigging in a storm shrieks hideously. Within the house, two voices arose in anger, a slender lash, whistling delirious rage, and the dreadful sound of a thick lash, booming and wheezing, until it drowned the other voice in a silence of blood beneath the noise of the ash. So the noise of the ash tree becomes an objective equivalent, objective correlate, if you like, to the dreadful sound prevailing in the domestic scene. So there are so many scenes, really. Even at the end of the novel, I can read for you the ending. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Morel is no more. As you know that she was a patient of cancer. So she died. And you find that is towards the very end, our hero is feeling quite frantic, desperate. And time and again, I, you know, that the, Clara has gone back to her husband. Uh, the relationship between Miriam and Paul uh, has been shattered to pieces. And in the last chapter, uh, they again met, but it was, uh, the meeting was no good. The meeting was no success. So it was not a successful meeting, really. So when we uh, read the conclusion, I mean the concluding paragraph of the novel, it is very vital for us. Uh, but before that, I would like to tell, uh, to tell you that is, uh, Mr. Morrell, you know, he is passing through a very shabby condition. So uh, things are really falling apart. The center cannot hold. So you remember that is this opening line of W.B. It says, Second coming, things fall apart, center cannot hold. The center was Mrs. Morrill. So when she dies, things fall apart indeed. So I read the concluding section of the novel. Mother, he whimpered, mother. She was the only thing that held him up himself with all this, and she was gone, intermingled herself. He wanted her to touch him, having alongside with her. But no, he would not give in. Turning sharply, he walked towards the city's gold phosphorescence. His fists were shut, his mouth set fast. He would not take the direction to the darkness to follow her. He walked towards the faintly humming, glowing town quickly. So if you read this concluding paragraph of the novel, I, I, I'm again, I'm telling you, this is symbolically loaded. This is loaded with symbolism. Because you see this uh, faintly humming, glowing town, it is perhaps symbolic of the hope. The novel ends on a note of hope. So this glowing town is symbolizing hope. So Paul Morrill is not going to succumb to the suicidal despair. Paul Morrill is going to have a fresh start in his life. He would break up a new avenue in his life. He won't feel the spirit anymore. So he is moving in the direction of light. Is moving in the direction of hope. So this is important that way. So you see, uh, so I could, you know, there are so many issues really, but it's not possible 
for uh, for me to discuss all the issues obviously you can understand so i i initially discussed the autobiographical novel secondly the edipal novel and third the use of symbol and uh, what is symbol i just talked a bit about image but i merely talked about the use of symbol in the novel so i i, I hope that you have uh, i mean understood uh, the issues that i have discussed so far so now uh, it is already uh, 15 minutes past so do you have any questions i'm ready to address the questions yes sir please raise your questions time is running out quick time is running out uh, i hated the psychoanalysis you by d h lawrence uh, please be louder psychoanalysis please be louder psychoanalysis sir d h lawrence uh, said i hated the psychoanalysis to you yeah yeah that is that is his angry yeah, his reaction his angry reaction to the critical article on sansar article on sansar the author was alfred booth gartner the author was alfred lawrence the author was alfred booth gartner lawrence i mean could not lawrence shit i mean could not this kind of psychoanalytic approach to to his yeah, novel sansar lovers novel sansar lovers and he reacted vehemently and he reacted vehemently uh because uh, as already i pointed out as already i pointed this, out he time and again wanted to time and again tell us that he us, did not that he belong did not to the disciples of the disciples sigmund freud sigmund freud so actually he wanted to tell his readers his readers that uh, that uh, is it possible to pigeon hold my novel to pigeon hold my novel it's not possible so that was his anger response to the critical call by alfred gartner i hated it because my novel is a fairly complete truth and they carve only a half line out of only a half line out that is his point of that is his point of okay okay sir okay gartner any question gartner any question ठीक आज बुझे सी एनीवन एनीवन इफ यू हैव रीड द नॉवेल फाइन इफ यू हैव रीड द नॉवेल इफ यू हैव नॉट रीड द नॉवेल इफ यू हैव नॉट रीड द नॉवेल प्लीज uh at least go through the detailed uh, summary go through the detailed chapter wise okay chapter wise it would help yeah flower sir this is symbol ta apni bolna no ta ami thik we which symbol bird which symbol bird flowers 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 in sansar lovers there are different flowers sansar lovers there are different flowers lily flower Lily carnation petal carnation okay petal then white roses then white fine. roses fine so when we so read the we read the section the, which is called mad and glass love story i mean uh, the, the story of paul model and mimi levers they do find that is they do find that is, uh, the uh, white flowers have a pre predominant role have a pre predominant this white color of the white flower is symbolic is of symbolic almost the platonic almost relationship the platonic between paul and mary between paul and mary got it but got when it. you talk about the relation between clara relation and paul clara and the carnation petal the carnation which petal, almost resembles the drops of blood the drops of obviously it signifies in symbolic terms in symbolic the sensual relation between sensual that senior lady and of course the protagonist Okay. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, the difference because complex and electro complex. Ele, pardon, electra. Pardon, electra. Yes, sir. Because no. complex and electro complex. Uh, the point is, as you know, that Freud speaks of different 
complexes right speaks up different so the xp complex is the father daughter relationship is the father daughter but it's not available here it's not available in sons and lovers as the title of the novel signifies sons and lovers sons and so two misses moral sons moral sons so here we have the what we call to use the freudian term oedipus complex oedipus Anything? Any other issue you would like? Anything? Any other issue you would like? Sir, Graham half. Jeta address love story. Bol chau. Ita si Paul Morel. Sir, Graham half. Graham half. Je adolescent love story kotha bol chau. Ita auto bag. Ha ha ha. So. Ha ha ha. So kahan je Paulis songe tar bila be mane fiance se love story ita uta si. He he tells us that he tells us that he is. It's a point in representation of an adolescent love story. That is available in the part one of Sons and Lovers. One of Sons and Lovers. Okay, not part one in Sons and Lovers. Part one in Sons and Lovers. Because Miriam is introduced in part one. But in part two, we have a full fledged treatment of the love story of Paul and Miriam. Okay. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. And best of luck. Okay, for exam. Okay, exam. bye. Take Hello, care. Sir. Bye. Take yeah. Care. Bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Hmm. Hello.